bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard, and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled Predicting Persistent Post-Concussion Problems in Pediatrics. I mean, that's a lot of Ps. All right, so we're really excited to have today's presentation as it's focused on concussion, and uh, there continues to be so much interest focused on the, on the topic uh, over the years, uh, starting with uh, Sidney Crosby's concussion a few years ago that really brought it to, to light, but it's really still in the, in the top of mind uh, and in the news and in the in the public in the in the popular media lots of lots of interesting stuff a lot of it driven by celebrity and and that sort of thing but uh, it's still good to have a spotlight on this important topic lots of research coming uh, to help uh, coming to completion that's really helping everyone understand the real impact of this issue today and today's presentation uh, uh, coming as a result of one of the world's largest studies in pediatric concussion so that's going to be a very exciting to hear uh, today's topic as well and I'll, before we go on, though, I'd also like to thank the uh, CHEO Research Institute, who as uh, one of our knowledge translation partners, not only helps fund our KT program, including the CAFC Presents webinar series, but they're also a great resource in identifying leading researchers and cutting-edge topics that we're able to bring to the stage. And I'd like to thank Adrian Vino for uh, helping identify not just this topic, but many topics uh, from not, and not only from the CHEO Research Institute, but helping identify leaders uh, from across the child and youth health care research uh, community to bring to the stage. So thanks again to the CHEO Research Institute. All right, so it's, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Roger Zemek uh, is a physician, a pediatric emergency physician, uh, practicing at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, or CHEO as we call it, uh, in the emergency department. And he's also, as I mentioned, a scientist at the CHEO Research Institute. He's an associate professor in the departments of pediatric and emergency medicine, and he holds a clinical research chair in pediatric concussion at the University of Ottawa. He's also the director of clinical research at CHEO and the vice uh, chair of the pediatric emergency of Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, or PERC. Uh, that's a network of uh, emergency uh, departments across Canada. So uh, it's my pleasure to hand uh, the virtual podium over to uh, you, Dr. Zemek. Over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Doug, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to speak to, to all of you today. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the topic of today's talk. As Doug uh, inferred, there's lots of pieces, there's in fact five of them. So the study is, we used to uh, call it as a team members, was the 5P study. Um, this is a, a study that's a mem uh, Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, or PERC study, and we love our acronyms at PERC. So uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, the 5P study today. So I do have uh, some learning objectives that all of you would hopefully be able to take away from today's uh, presentation. Uh, first, hopefully all of you will be able to describe persistent post-concussion symptoms and their epidemiology in the pediatric population. Second, uh, after applying the results of the 5P study, I hope that you'll be able to identify the factors that will be able to predict which children will have a longer duration of concussion symptoms. And third, using the 5P results, being able to counsel and provide anticipatory guidance to uh, families in those patients at high risk, and then be able to refer those patients at higher risk for concussion consistent systems to a um, more specialized care uh, sooner rather than later. So I want to actually start with a little poll question. Um, and you can vote by your, um, your screen. Um, what I want to see is, by, just by show of hands, how many of you have ever had a prior concussion? Often it looks like 47% uh, have had a concussion and 53% have not. So I am, uh, like many of you, is um, I have had a concussion. In fact, I've had several. Uh, one of them I had even when I was in middle school. I lost consciousness for uh, actually almost two minutes. And uh, for that reason, when I've became a pediatric physician and pediatric emergency physician and saw how many concussions we had in the emergency department. Um, 
it was very important for me to be able to study something for which I had a passion. And so uh, my interest in this topic is, is not only academic, but it's personal. Um, so that is uh, the reason how I got into becoming a pediatric emergency uh, concussion researcher. Um, and I find that's very uh, helpful for when, when these big projects require so much time and effort. Um, but when I move on to, um, let's get everyone on the same page on what is a concussion. So what is a concussion? Uh, years ago, uh, concussion could be, would require you to have to necessarily have a loss of consciousness or a um, amnesia. And back when I was a resident back in the 90s, uh, if you didn't have one of those, you weren't called to have concussion. We know that's different now. Uh, the current concussion definition is a concussion is a complex pathophysiologic process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biomechan biomechanical forces. And what you could think of that is, is uh, your brain is like a bowl of jello, uh, and that jello uh, shakes inside that bowl, which is your skull. It is not a bruising of the brain. Uh, a bruising of the brain, uh, if you had a bruise, you'd get a collection of blood. So if you bruised your leg, you get a black and blue. And that uh, blood, um, if it was in the brain, would actually show up on a CT scan. But we know that CT scans and standard uh, neuroimaging does not show any structural changes with concussion. So we know it's not a bruise, um, but it is an injury to the brain. And that what happens is it causes a stretching of the neurons, and those neurons uh, are affected, and it prevents the proper signaling of the um, cascade down the axon of that neuron. And therefore, it will not show up on normal structural imaging. Now, to get that stretching of the neurons due to the trauma, you don't even have to hit your head. You could have a blow to your chest. So a chest-to-chest -to -chest while skating and hockey uh, can still lead to that whiplashing effect of the head, or um, an injury to the neck could even cause still the rotation of the head. And any direct or indirect blow in which that brain uh, accelerates and decelerates can cause a concussion. Uh, a traditional a cartoon type image if you were watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon and a, uh, a villain hits uh, a hero on the head with a hammer, that typically will not cause a concussion uh, because the brain is not necessarily accelerating or decelerating. Uh, those are the sorts of injuries in which you would get a depressed skull fracture or perhaps that sort of bruising or bleeding, uh, which we, we would call a subdural or epidural hematoma uh, to the brain in those instances. Um, but as we now know, and I referred to later, now we know uh, concussion can be caused by um, any types of those acceleration, deceleration, with rotational being even more important. And as I mentioned, we know that loss of consciousness and amnesia, while common uh, symptoms, are not required to make the diagnosis. So as I, as I wanted to start studying concussion, it certainly helped having a steady access to patients. And certainly we know a concussion, as uh, it was referred to in the introduction, uh, has gotten a lot of media attention, but it's always been very common. We know that up to 3.8 million concussions occur annually in North America, uh, resulting in over, over 700,000 ED visits a year in the United States for pediatric concussion. And the numbers are uh, similarly um, proportional in Canada. There was an epidemiological study that showed that in Ontario, the incidence doubled between 2003 and 2010, and we actually have some preliminary data to show it doubled again in the subsequent four years. So a quadrupling almost in the past decade of the number of pediatric visits for concussion. However, for us to be able to track the number of visits, we typically need to have a visit. And as we know, not every child who has a concussion um, will seek medical attention. Sometimes we know that sometimes those kids with concussion will not even tell a parent or coach, and therefore no one's even aware. So for those reasons, the true incidence of uh, concussion is very difficult to estimate because it does require uh, disclosure of the symptoms or recognition of the symptoms and further even seeking medical care for them to be able to be tracked in uh, large, large databases on a provincial or federal level. And for that, the Center of Disease Control in the United States has called concussion a silent epidemic. So I wanted to start with a little case vignette. And as I go through this uh, vignette, uh, just think in your mind is how likely is this, this young woman or this uh, teenage girl going to have persisting symptoms for? So let's say you have, in, you're working in either your um, 
uh, emergency department or imagine if you work in a, a primary care clinic if you would see a child like this often. 13-year-old girls playing soccer and collides with another player. Uh, she has no loss of consciousness and no amnesia to the event. However, uh, her coach and her parents at the sideline notice her to be a bit unsteady, and as she moves to the sideline after the collision, she's a bit slow to answer questions. She's complaining of headache, feeling foggy, and she's feeling tired. Uh, wisely, the uh, coach and the parents uh, adopt the correct assumption, if in doubt, sit her out and do not have her return to play that same day. And in fact, uh, they just leave the, the the field of play to go home. Um, they're only home for a few minutes and um, they find that some of the bright noise, lights and some of the loud noises have continued to have made her symptoms worse. Um, so they actually decide to go to the emergency room to seek care. On history, the emergency physician asks about uh, common past um, medical problems and she discloses that she's never had a prior concussion and she has no history of having migraines in the past. In the emergency department, the doctor does a full neurological evaluation, including um, some cognitive testing and balance testing. And some cognitive testing, the provider goes through um, some digit span backwards. So, for example, they gives a, he gives her the numbers 157, and she has to repeat backwards 751, and she does all those correctly. She's able to remember words. Um, and when he does the balance testing for her, um, he does the, uh, she finds that she's having some problems on the, the, ba the balance error scoring system, BESS, which we'll actually introduce later on in the talk. So you finish your, evalu the, you finish your evaluation. Um, the two questions that parents are always sure to ask is, one, um, when is my child gonna get better? Is he get better in a couple of days, four to five days? Uh, one to two weeks, one month, greater than a month, and um, when will she be able to return to sport? Um, is it whenever she wants? Is it when she's having resolution of the symptoms or graduated, or should she follow a graduated step rise return to activities? So my question for the audience is, are we able to predict the duration of post-concussive symptoms? So if I gave you that case vignette, and perhaps uh, if the organizers, Doug, could you pull up the, the voting thing? My question for you is, is that girl for that first question, is she going to be high risk, medium, or low risk for having symptoms that last on the longer scale, let's say the one month or more, or is she likely to recover in the first uh, couple of weeks? Yes, we can, we can insert the poll then. Okay. Um, so do you think this girl is have uh, low risk, medium risk, or high risk for having persistent symptoms? And we'll look at that. 31% say they can't predict, 41% uh, okay. medium, 26% uh, say low risk, and only 2% put her in the high risk category. Okay. So many of you said uh, you can't predict. So let's talk about that. Can we predict the duration of post-concussion symptoms? Well, that was the first thing uh, I wanted to be able to answer, um, but let's make sure we're all on the same page for what PCS or persistent post-concussive symptoms are. So this PCS is also known as a prolonged concussion, um, also sometimes known in some literature as uh, post-concussion syndrome. There are a couple definitions for it. The DSM-4 uh, uses three months or longer of symptoms. Uh, ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Diseases, uses uh, symptoms that last more than a month, and you typically need uh, three or more symptoms. And symptoms can persist in uh, various domains. They can affect uh, somatic or physical symptoms, such as headache, dizziness, or fatigue. Um, they can have co cognitive impairment, where children are having problems remembering things or concentrating. It can result in psychological changes where children are more angry or frustrated. Um, kids who are normally uh, uh, very quiet have be start acting out. Um, uh, and converse, gregarious children uh, become more, uh, can become more quiet. It can also affect sleep. This can result in kids being unable to do the things they want, need, and love doing. So uh, missing school, missing going out to the movies with their friends because the bright lights and the loud noises of the cineplexes are too um, exacerbating for their symptoms and uh, missing the things they love, such as doing their sport. 
uh, the consolation of all these symptoms and missing out on, on their regular activities of daily living result in a lower quality of life. And so being able to predict if PCS can um, occur, it could really help parents know what's in store. Uh, people sometimes uh, may uh, become a vicious cycle because patients think they're going to get better and then the two weeks go by and they're not better yet and then they uh, become that um, downward spiral of, of frustration, the expectations are not meeting reality and that can actually lead to um, um, more exacerbation of, of some of the psychological symptoms, uh, anxiety, et cetera. So being able to provide realistic anticipatory guidance to both the patients and parents may help. Second, it may result in improved adherence to guidelines and reduced risk of second impact. But most importantly, it's very important to be able to target those at high risk in order to uh, begin novel treatments. If we know that a child at high risk, we might be able to send them to earlier follow-up with concussion specialists. We may be able to advance um, the current evidence for the management of concussion. Currently, there's uh, no effective therapeutics been shown on any randomized controlled trial for concussion. That might be actually due to the fact that um, a lot of these trials are so hard to design because of the fact that you have to enroll so many kids to see an effect. And if we were able to only target those children who were at highest risk, um, uh, it would be much more able to do a study with a more appropriate sample size and uh, also not exposing children who are going to recover quickly to medications with a potential side effect profile, uh, such as a neuropsychotropic medication. And thirdly, in those children who you also know are at high risk, it can, we can target further neuropsychological testing and or training. So in order to answer the question of can we predict the persistent post-concussion symptoms, um, my team and I actually uh, began a systematic review. This was actually due to a, a patient encounter that I remember vividly. I was working in the emergency department. Uh, I am at CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and we have an annual ED census of about 70,000 children per year. I remember uh, explicitly seeing how it was, I was shocked with how many kids with concussion we were seeing and I did some um, uh, rough numbers and we see about a thousand children with concussion uh, each year at GEO uh, in the emergency department, which when you divide it up by the number of days in the year, it's almost three kids a day on average with uh, a new concussion presenting. And there was this young man who was uh, trying to finish his uh, final year of high school. He was 17. He was having now his fourth or fifth concussion. And um, the previous ones had lasted months. It was affecting his ability to do the sports that he loved. He couldn't uh, concentrate at school. He went from a, a A, B student with the hopes of getting into university to now um, worrying about if he could apply to a vocational school because of the grades were uh, really suffering. And uh, the father just wanted to know, how long is this next one going to last? And I had no answer for him. So our team, in response to that, did a, what's called a systematic review, where we uh, peer-reviewed the literature search string and then conducted a systematic review. And um, over about of the 500 uh, manuscripts, 12 studies uh, were included, but there was a lot of uh, contradictory evidence and minimal evidence to associate um, clinical factors with the risk of having PCS. The problem with the literature was that most of the studies were either of uh, elite male athletes doing a sport such as uh, hockey players in Canada or football players in the U.S., um, or they were only for sports injuries, uh, or they excluded children with any sort of pre-existing medical condition. But could, that could be as simple as having anxiety or ADHD or even just a, a history of depression in the family. And as we know, these things are common, and, and in real life, uh, these things uh, often are present in our patients. We know ADHD is common. We know that uh, anxiety is common. We know that having uh, prior concussions uh, sometimes wasn't even exclusion criteria. So we wanted to be able to um, be able to take what was in the literature. And because of the fact that it was mostly older children, we were unable to generalize to younger. And because it was almost all boys, we were unable to generalize to girls. So uh, the conclusion of our 
our systematic review was that clinicians could not identify who was at higher risk. So the answer to my initial question, could we predict the um, duration of post-concussion symptoms? Well, it was not yet. So how did we want to address this? Well, um, we thought, we really felt that this is a question that really required answering. So I, uh, I built a team. Um, for many of you remember the 80s, this was a popular TV show, The A-Team, and uh, we did actually assemble a, an A-Team of concussion researchers. So we got a grant from the CIHR to plan a multi-center study to identify what are the prognosticators for persistent concussion symptoms to guide future treatment and research. Um, and so we brought in experts uh, from uh, all over North America uh, who were people who had uh, expertise in pediatrics, neurology, neurosurgery, sports medicine. Um, we brought in parents, we brought in patients, and we basically had this uh, diverse expertise, roundtable discussions, and um, we had a lot of statistical this, uh, uh, debate, and af after two days, we had a concrete plan for how we would go about in designing a study to answer this question. And so um, we, we had this plan, and now it was important to uh, get some good, good um, relationships to be able to pull off a large study like this. So um, I really wanted to acknowledge uh, Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, uh, the existence of whom would not make studies like this possible. Pediatric Emergency Canada is a network of uh, like-minded uh, pediatric academic centers across Canada. There are 13 emergency departments that are members of PERC across uh, the provinces, and it's an avenue in which we can um, do multi-center studies. The Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation is another organization uh, without whom uh, this research would not have been possible. They are um, a not-for-profit Ontario-based um, uh, charity, uh, charitable foundation that provides um, funding to support the advancement of uh, neurotrauma-based research such as stroke and traumatic brain injury. And lastly, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, um, again, to do a study that uh, I'm about to describe without uh, CHR would not be possible. So we did apply and, got, and were successful with getting funding for, uh, uh, to do our study, the 5P study, the Predicting Persistent Post-Concussive Problems in Pediatrics. And the primary objective of this study was to derive a clinical prediction rule for PCS using clinically available factors in children presented to the emergency room following concussion. And what I mean by clinically available factors is things that anyone could have available no matter where they are. So you could be in a small hospital uh, two hours away from the nearest tertiary center, you would still be able to be able to predict uh, for your patient the duration of symptoms on their ED presentation without having to send that child to arrange for advanced uh, MRI, functional MRI scanning, or to, without having to draw uh, serum or other biomarkers to send off to a lab in which we'd have to wait two weeks for the results to come back. So we enrolled children at nine centers across Canada, um, from basically the Maritimes to the Rockies, um, and there were um, these nine hospitals that were uh, taking part. So what we did in our study, we enrolled children prospectively, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, we collected data as they presented to the emergency room using iPads and directly inputted it into what's called Research Electronic Data Capture, or REDCap for short. We had two phases of the study. The first phase was just over a year, and that was to derive the clinical prediction rule. And then um, in another subsequent nine months, we then validated a rule in an entirely separate uh, new cohort of children to confirm that it was correct. We followed up the children um, at one week, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. We did have face-to-face -face follow up at four weeks and 12 weeks um, for children to do neuropsychological testing at the four largest hospitals, um, but I don't have those results to share with you today. Um, perhaps I can always come back another time and talk about the neuropsychological uh, testing. So in the emergency department, we uh, collected a a battery of tests. It was about a 30-minute evaluation. We did what was called the acute concussion evaluation, or ACE for short. Um, we did the child SCAT-3, um, which is put out by the um, consensus statement on sports. 
we, which includes also tests of orientation, concentration, memory, and balance. We had interviews for child, parents, and physicians filled out a data collection form. We actually did a separate, entirely repeated inter-rater test in which a second independent person recollected all the data on 10% of the sample to make sure the data was uh, accurate and reliable. I know I'm going to bring up a lot of these uh, alphabet soups, um, such as ACE and Child's Got 3 and BESS. Uh, I do want to put a little plug in for uh, work our team did previously. We had developed the first pediatric concussion guidelines, again, sponsored by the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. If any of you want to have um, versions of the ACE or Child's Got 3 or uh, PCSI, which I'll be mentioning in a moment, these are all available in our guidelines that are a free download. It is on the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation website. So if you Google ONF and Pediatric Concussion Guidelines, uh, you will see the link to download that. I know some of you on the call are healthcare providers, but we have people from uh, other um, disciplines and uh, connections to healthcare as well. There is not only the healthcare provider version, but there is a school and uh, coaches version, and as well as there is a parent version. So there are all three versions for download. Uh, so if any of you want to see what those tests uh, look like, um, there are inside the uh, guidelines is a interactive PDF, and you can click, and there's a whole toolbox in which all of these tools are available uh, for, again, for free download to, uh, to print out or use uh, live on your iPads or on your, uh, on your computers. This is the PCSI. Uh, the PCSI is the Post-Concussion Symptom Inventory, and this is the tool that we use to measure their outcomes at the one week, two weeks, four weeks, etc. It's a tool that um, has a relativistic um, component, meaning we're not just wanted to know how they are today, uh, we wanted to know how it compared to they were before their injury. If any of you have uh, teenage children at home or nieces or nephews, uh, if I were to pass that survey to you and only ask how are you today, I am sure many of you with your teenage uh, children may say that they're fatigued, irritable, uh, feeling slowed down, um, and, and or maybe even having a headache. Uh, that could happen on any given day in a, in, a, in a teenage life. But what we want to know is how it really compares to the before the injury. So what we would do is we would administer the survey at each time of uh, the follow-up, and we would then subtract the current minus the pre-injury. And if as long as the uh, net effect was zero or below, we know that the uh, it was not a symptom. So if you said you were uh, two for... Uh, having some nausea, but you always had nausea of two every morning, that's uh, not a new symptom or worsening symptom. However, if you said you were a four or five today and your previous was two, the difference between those would be a positive integer and therefore that would count as a symptom. And consistent with the ICD-10, the International Classification of Disease um, definition, three or more persisting symptoms would qualify as um, persisting concussion symptoms. I wanted everyone to, if you're at your laptop or at your desktop and you have a little bit of space, I want everyone to actually take this moment and stand up. Uh, normally we do this uh, when I give presentations as a, uh, a demonstration, and I'd love to try to do this uh, virtually as well. So I am going to implore you to, to take off your headsets if you can and, and stand up for a moment. And what we're going to do is the balance our scoring system testing for balance. There's two um, tests in the child version. There's actually three in the adult, but uh, we're going to do the child version because this is a talk on pediatrics. And in fact, the third test is probably uh, not even as necessary because the tandem stance alone is probably what you need. So the first test for balance our scoring system is what's called the double leg stance. Uh, you should have your shoes off. Now, again, I will not make you do that at your, uh, at your work. Uh, but if you can, just uh, put your feet together, heels together and toes, uh, big toes together, uh, as demonstrated in that image on the left. And you would put your hands on your hips and there's a slight, there's just the slightest bend to the knees. And as you can see in this image, the, uh, the gentleman's eyes is closed. And that's what you need to do is you need to close your eyes. So what you do is you would hold this position for 20 seconds. And you can all begin. And as, as the 20 seconds start to count down, I'll describe what we're looking for. 
We're looking for you to see if you take your hand off your hip, you sway from side to side too much, you take a step uh, away out of position, or the eyes are open. If any of those things occur, uh, it counts as an error. So the 20 seconds are now up for that double-legged stance. Um, and again, this is the first test you do. Um, the simpler of one, and most people do not get any errors on this. In the 20 seconds, most people have zero or maybe maximum one error. If you are evaluating a patient and they cannot get into position, or if they go out of position and cannot get back in within five seconds, they are scored the maximum number of errors in those 20 seconds, which is called uh, 10 or 10 points. Um, what you're really trying to do is if someone takes a step, moves their arm off and opens their eyes simultaneously as a surprise because they had to take a step, that does not count as three errors. Um, it's an event. So um, it's how many quick events occur. But if they take their hand off their hip, put it right back, open their eyes separately, close their eyes again, uh, sway a bit in three separate events, that would be three points. Now it's time to move to the tandem stance. I'm going to all have you pretend there's an imaginary soccer ball in front of you, and you're going to give it a little kick. And the foot you kicked it with is you're considered your dominant foot. Now you're going to pretend that you're walking an imaginary tightrope or balance beam, and your heels uh, on your, your dominant foot should be touching your toe of your non-dominant foot, and that should be, again, in an imaginary straight line like you're, again, walking that tightrope. And again, you bend your knees just ever so slightly, put your hands on your hips, and you close your eyes. And in about three seconds, we're going to start counting down. Three, two, one. You're going to go do this for 20 seconds. And again, we're going to see if you're able to uh, maintain that position without opening your eyes, uh, swaying your hands, uh, moving your uh, hands off your hips, uh, etc. And you have five seconds to go. And done. So I don't know if any of you found this usually a bit more challenging uh, of a test, and, and we'll get to why, this, why I had you do this exercise, because it's something that I'm actually going to have you hopefully adopt as part of your uh, concussion evaluation. So in this study, we included kids who were uh, five up to their 18th birthday. They had to present with a concussion consistent with the Zurich consensus statement for concussion. They had to have their initial injury within the previous 48 hours. Uh, this is an important uh, distinction because some of the previous studies on concussion would enroll kids up to seven or 10 days post their injury. And it's a lot easier to predict at someone who's still in, uh, extremely symptomatic at 10 days if they're gonna have symptoms for a month as compared to predicting someone within two or three hours of injury. Um, so we did not want to buy a sample. Kids had to have a, a GCS of 14 or above and had to be obviously English or French speaking. As mentioned, we wanted to have a concussion only basis. So we were not interested in having kids with positive CT brain injuries. Kids did not have to have a CT to be in the study, but if they had one, it had to be negative. Kids with broken arms that required sedation or any other multi-system injuries uh, were excluded. Kids who were intoxicated and thus were unable to test their balance and wasn't sure if whether that was the uh, intoxication or if it was the uh, concussion uh, would uh, muddy the waters were excluded as well. And similar kids who had like a seizure or had syncope and then fell down as part of their syncope, um, while they may have hit their head, it was unclear if their symptoms were due to the concussion or due to the fact that whatever caused their syncope was still causing symptoms. And again, what we were looking at was who had PCS at one month. And as I introduced before, we use the PCSI. Well, the version I showed you is actually the teenager or the parent version, which are the same, but there are developmentally specific versions for younger children as well. Uh, there's a five up to their eighth birthday version and an eight through 12. Again, those are also available on that uh, Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation uh, Pediatric Concussion Guideline website. So we developed our study and um, we started to enroll patients and uh, I think it was a true team effort and we constantly were taking uh, tips from each other on how to best uh, ensure good follow-up and make sure everything worked smoothly and now it's time to share with you the results of this study. So in the derivation phase, we uh, enrolled uh, over 2,600 patients. Um, and of those 2,600 patients, 
we had just over 1,700 complete uh, their one-month follow-up, uh, which is just about 85%. In the validation phase, we enrolled another th just over 1,000 patients, again, uh, 883 who completed their um, one-month follow-up. So the 3,000-plus patients uh, between the two phases is by far the largest concussion study to date. The, the largest previous one uh, prior to this was only 600 children, but it, was not, uh, uh, it certainly was not even as rigorous or as um, prospective as the one that we did. So I wanted to talk to you about what does a typical concussion patient look like that shows up to a pediatric emergency department in Canada. Well, the average age was uh, just under 12 years old. 38% uh, were female. Most were presenting to the ED within uh, three hours of their injury um, with the interquartile range, meaning the 25th uh, percentile and the 75th percentile range between uh, just, uh, just under an hour and a half and uh, 11 hours. Three quarters of kids well, were presenting with their first concussion, um, but there were some kids who had had previous, so uh, even 8% uh, had uh, now presented with their third concussion with this current one. 12% of children did present with loss of consciousness, which means that, again, um, uh, five-sixths of the kids uh, did not uh, have loss of consciousness. We had, um, for the kids who did have loss of consciousness, their duration of that was very short. It was only about 30 seconds um, uh, in general. For early signs, about half the kids were having the feeling of being dazed and confused. 24% uh, were confused about the events of what occurred to their concussion. 40% were answering questions slowly. 13% uh, were repeating the uh, questions uh, to parents or other providers. And 20% also had some uh, recall problems. Two-thirds of the injuries were due to sports, with uh, this being Canada, hockey was the most common uh, injury due to sports, um, but about a quarter were due to non-sports related falls. So that could be slipping on the ice, um, running in the uh, hallway at school and uh, colliding into a locker, um, uh, and, and or all the other non-types um, of sports play. So as we followed these children up, um, it's important to note that a lot of the previous literature and conversation on concussion would state that most kids, it used to say 80, 85% of people would be better in, in uh, 7 to 10 days following their concussion. And unfortunately, that is not uh, what appears to be the case, at least in the children who present to pediatric emergency departments. Uh, at one week, 56% of patients are still having three or more symptoms. At two weeks, 40% uh, are still having symptoms. By one month, um, the good news is 70% of kids have, have recovered, but 30% of kids are still having uh, three or more symptoms. And this persists along even through uh, three months. What we did was we looked at um, the um, 70 different predictors that we had identified before beginning this study um, and examine them one-on-one -on -one, or what's also known as univariate or univariable analysis. And we found that there were 45 factors that were significantly associated with persisting symptoms at one month. But one-on-one -on -one is not as important as how they do in the context of something else. So, uh, for example, if uh, loss of consciousness uh, was a predictor, but also having a loss of consciousness duration was also a predictor. Um, when you put both of them together, they may not be. Um, or conversely, once put in a combination of having a personal history of migraine, they both may go away. So this is called multivariable or multivariate analysis. And we looked at how do uh, various predictors look when in context of all the others. And this is a statistical technique called uh, logistic regression. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details uh, for the purposes of this conversation, um, but uh, what I could say is that each of these variables listed on the sheet are important um, even if other things are present. 
And what it really breaks down to is that there are nine different factors that help predict how long concussion lasts for, uh, with a few things, meaning the age group, uh, sex, and early fatigue uh, having a higher um, risk ratios than uh, some other various variables as well. I'll get into this uh, summarize. I'll summarize this uh, in, a, in a subsequent slide to, and hopefully make that a bit more clear for uh, for those of you not as familiar with the statistics. What we did was we looked at what's called the area under the curve. The green diagonal lines in these two figures uh, indicate what chance alone would be with regards to prediction. So if this were a study of coin flips, the uh, the green bar would indicate. Uh, what a standard coin flip chance would be. The blue lines uh, indicate how well the uh, performance of uh, the prediction score on the left and how physicians do on the right perform. And as you can see, the farther we move that curve to the left, upper left, the better it does, because uh, we're looking at the area under that blue line. Uh, for that uh, piece of pizza that we're looking for. And the bigger the piece of pizza, the, the bigger the piece, uh, the, the better we do. And as you can see, the area under the curve for the prediction model um, is significantly higher than the prediction uh, curve than how we did when we did, when we asked physicians uh, how long they think the symptoms last for. And this is an important finding and basically says that the rule does better than the doctors, um, which according to the literature would make sense because there was nothing in the literature. So how are you going to remember what are the what are the predictors? Well, it really breaks down into five main categories, and some of you may work in other types of uh, healthcare fields other than pediatrics or other than emergency or, or brain injury, and there's lots of things in medicine in which we assign point scores. There's things like the Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, one of the most famous ones is the Framingham Risk Score. And this was a study that assigned points based on uh, different factors and that would predict your risk of having uh, a cardiac disease. And so we use that same method and we use their risk ratios and from that we were able to assign points uh, using what's called the Sullivan method. And it really breaks down to five main categories. So the first category for risk is your demographics. It's how old are you and what is your sex? And as you can see, the older kids have higher risk than the younger kids. And the girls have higher risk than the boys. Um, I know some of you may be thinking to yourself, uh, and again, please feel free to type in any questions you have to, uh, to the organizers, uh, and I'll be happy if, if um, in fact, if there's questions, uh, if there's a, a couple that have already popped up, feel free to, to jump in and let me know, and I'll take some as we go. Um, but often a common question is, well, why are girls at higher risk? We don't really, uh, we can't really prove why they're at higher risk, but there's a few theories. First, the mechanisms of injury, um, uh, while they may be similar, the anatomy of boys and girls are different. For example, girls have thinner necks than boys in general. And because a lot of the injury for concussion is due to the rotation or the snapping of the neck, a less muscular neck uh, may be more uh, able or uh, at risk for having a greater whiplash effect. Second, uh, girls um, may be more um, likely to just be honest or they're more aware of their own symptoms. So when asked on follow-up if you're still symptomatic, girls may be more likely to uh, tell the truth or because they are aware of it. Boys may A, not be aware and then don't report, or B, are aware but are not being as open or honest uh, with their persisting symptoms and therefore haven't disclosed that. And third, maybe actual biological differences uh, due to hormonal balances. Uh, as girls go through puberty, they have higher levels of estrogen and progesterone, and those do have effects on the brain. Um, and boys' uh, hormone uh, during puberty is typically testosterone, and testosterone may actually have a bit of more of a, perfect, a protective effect on the brain. So there are, there are many explanations as to the possible whys, and those are things that we hope to explore later. So again, just to reiterate, the first category for risk is their demographics. The second category is their past medical history. So um, 
I wanted to make sure this is explained because on a table, there's not a lot of space to do it. This is not how long their symptoms have lasted for their current concussion. <laughs> it's how long has their symptoms lasted in their prior concussion if they had one. So did they have a prior concussion in which the symptom lasted for um, greater than a week? If so, they get one point. If they had a concussion that if they had two prior concussions, but they both recovered within five days, they got zero points, which is the same risk as never having a concussion before. The other past history is of whether they had a personal history of migraine. The next category is an early cognitive question. So how were they answering questions? It's not that they get the questions right. They still may know who they are, where they are, uh, how it happened but they may be processing things more slowly and it's more likely that processing um, that is the clue or the key to um, the concussion and that they may recover longer. Remember I had you all stand up and do those balance testings? Well, that was for a reason. That tandem stance testing uh, is a significant predictor of, you know, of the 70 ones we looked at and of the 45 that remain significant, of the nine that were left, that, that tandem stance was one of those nine. So it is an important uh, element. And if kids have four or more errors in the 20 seconds where they're unable to even get in the position and hold it, uh, that is a predictor of how they do at one month. And these, again, are kids in which we enrolled on average three hours from their time of injury. So you're predicting something from three hours to a month away, and um, that's an important test. Now, with regards to that uh, tandem test, I find it's also very important clinically. Um, as you have sometimes a patient, they are very wobbly. And the parents, as I mentioned earlier, the second question they always ask is when they can get back to sports. Uh, my daughter, she's got an important hockey tournament in Kingston next week, and we already booked the hotel. I, I hope we can go. Well, if you do that tandem stance and they can't even get in the position, um, that's usually a fairly convincing thing to the parents to say, listen, do you really want your child on skates when they can't even stand uh, with their two feet together? Um, they're, they're not moving forward. They're not um, having any speed, nor are they trying to um, avoid another player or chase after a puck. And therefore, uh, I usually say caution. Hey, don't have them go out bicycle. Don't even ride a bicycle because uh, there they don't even have two feet on the ground uh, until their balance has recovered. And lastly are the three symptoms uh, of initial symptoms. So of all those symptoms I listed on the, the PCSI and the, the ACE, uh, of those 20, these were the three most uh, predictive at one month of persisting symptoms were headache, sensitivity to noise, and fatigue, which gets you an extra bonus uh, point, so two. So as you add them all up, the maximum number of points is 12, and the minimum is zero. And what we did then is we looked and we applied those points and we were able to estimate the risk and the observed risks were very similar, nearly identical to what the estimated risks were. And uh, from that, we were able to break it down into what we call a low risk or an, a medium risk and a high risk group. So as highlighted in the green, any points that are three or less give you an overall risk of about 10% or less. And if you're um, in that uh, nine points or above, nine through 12, your risk is now almost on average about 70%, um, 60, 65, 70%. And whereas if you're in that uh, medium, it averages out to be about 30%, which is your overall risk uh, without using the score anyway. So what do we do is we took that rule and now we tested that in another 1,000 patients to see how we did. And we again asked the doctors, but didn't tell them what the rule was. And uh, as you can see in, the same fi in this new figure, the blue line is the rule, the black line is the doctors, and the gray line is that coin flip chance alone. And um, the doctors were significantly worse than the rule. And the, the area was nearly identical to our 2,000 patient um, uh, area. So we were able to validate this, this rule. And here's some of the test characteristics uh, of the points in the validation phase. And in short, uh, we have a negative predictive value of about 85% and a sensitivity of about 94% for low risk. So what does that mean? If you have someone at low risk, you're pretty sure they're not going to be uh, low risk. If they're nine points or above, you have a positive predictive value of about 60% uh, and a specificity of 93. So you're really able to say, you know, if your points are pretty high, you're, you're much more likely. And what we say sometimes is the, uh, the, 
the relative risk um, of that. And what we can again say is that, in short, if you're low risk, you're about a third less likely to go on and have it. And if, but if you're high risk, you're about three times more likely to go on and have it. Um, and this kind of summarizes uh, uh, what I said with those likelihood ratios. You're about a third less likely if you're low risk and about three times more likely if you're, if you're high risk. So conventional wisdom is not always conventional and it's not always wise. Um, what people often would say when I was back again in uh, medical school and residency in the 90s is uh, the factors that were important were whether you lost consciousness or amnesia uh, or how many concussions you had. And interestingly, those are not, while they may be still important, they're not predictive for how you do at one month. Uh, and further, people say, well all, well, all the kids who have symptoms that last a long time are all depressed or anxious. And uh, we could talk about that more afterwards, or perhaps if there's a question on that. Um, that may still be important, um, and I do find that those play a role in the kids who have symptoms that last three months, four months, or once you get six months or beyond, I agree. Um, that's really now almost uh, a very high overlap with uh, depression and anxiety. But for the one month of symptoms, those were not as important. Uh, I might as well just bring up now, often the, the depression and anxiety is, uh, it's very interesting that people think there's a, a chicken and an egg sort of a relationship with that and those children who have very prolonged symptoms. Um, often what it is is many kids who would have, even if they didn't have a previous history of depression or a previous history of anxiety, they may have been predisposed to it for whatever reasons of their genetics or their family history. And what happens is perhaps having that injury has made that predisposing uh, risk become more uh, apparent. Um, but often you hear some, some of the people say, once you're talking about kids whose symptoms have lasted more than uh, six months or more than a year, uh, it's often not just the concussion alone. It is um, uh, combined with some also now um, mental health uh, issues such as depression, anxiety, or some other physiological issue that's contributing to why it's lasting so long. So let's go back to that uh, case vignette. Um, She's a 13-year-old who had that soccer collision. She had no loss of consciousness, no amnesia, but she was unsteady and slow to answer questions. She was having a headache. She was feeling tired. She was having symptoms worse with the loud noises and bright lights, but she had no prior concussion and no migraine. Her cognitive was normal, but her balance testing. So how would we apply the rule? We're going to take her age. We're going to take her a, a girl. She's had no prior concussion. She's had uh, no history of migraine, but she answered questions slowly. She had four more errors on her to balance testing. She had headache, sensitivity to noise, and was fatigued. So I'm going to ask you again. Can maybe Doug can pull up that question, uh, poll question. How many of you, you're going to vote again, how many of you think her symptoms are going to last uh, more than one month. Is she now low risk, medium risk, or high risk? Most people are paying attention, and 73% are saying she's, uh, she's at high risk, 25% saying medium, and 2% saying low. So I'm thrilled is that um, uh, no one's now saying they can't predict, um, and uh, the total for her is 10 points. So if you take the 10 points, again, she would be considered in that high-risk category. Um, now, again, those categories for cutoffs is how we uh, assign them, and again, we said nine or above uh, was high-risk. But again, someone could choose what they, in their own mind, think high-risk is. Um, we thought anything higher than 50% would be considered high. Um, other people may have their own uh, cutoff. So while there's a right answer and wrong answer, there's no true uh, right answers for this. But um, I'm glad that everyone felt that they were able to predict, and uh, the numbers that thought she was low was, um, was quite low. So that's excellent. If people want to read a little bit more about the details of this study, uh, we recently published the results of this study in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, in the March 8th issue. Uh, what's great is it's actually a free download. Often you have to be a member of JAMA or have an institutional subscription. This was their free download of the month. So anyone who wants to read more about this, uh, feel free to go to the JAMA website and uh, download the 
Um, uh, you could download the article in which there's uh, all the all the tables I presented, plus even uh, uh, far greater details on their baseline characteristics and uh, all the other um, sort of statistical analyses we did. So, so in summary, um, we were able to um, derive a clinical risk score that was significantly superior to clinicians' ability to predict uh, future PPCS at the time of ED presentation. We employed an easily calculable score that did not require summations of an entire inventory of 60 or 70 points. Um, because using something like that would have been a complex scale that would introduce a barrier to adoption by acute care clinicians. This 5P score that we derived has the potential to individualize concussion care throughout optimal system management and appropriate follow-up. By doing this, hopefully this will be able to help guide clinicians to provide evidence-based anticipatory guidance. And further, as I mentioned, future clinical benefits may include identifying high-risk individuals, individuals uh, for future screening, uh, prioritizing for specialization clinics. So for example, some of the clinics in Canada require you to have symptoms for at least one month before you can be referred. What I've been doing is applying the score in the emergency department, and if a child scores at nine or above, I'm putting the consult into the concussion clinic um, at the time of their ED presentation and say, this child is now high risk, please see them sooner. Uh, conversely, some of the clinics see every kid with concussion, uh, utilizing a massive amount of resources to see every kid. Perhaps those centers that have that policy might be able to take those kids who have scores of three or less and not have them necessarily uh, require follow-up at the specialty clinic. Further, hopefully this really will result in targeting for novel uh, emerging treatments to prevent PPCS. Um, and even if the score does not restrict who is qualified for a study, uh, any future studies that do this will hopefully be able to stratify PBCS risk in future trials to at least ensure that the groups are similar. So um, we had a massive team. Um, these are just some of the people listed uh, on the team um, who are the uh, clinician and scientists. There are even, <coughs> excuse me, there are even more people who uh, we're so key, all the research coordinators and research assistants across these nine sites, uh, without whom the study would not be possible. Um, in the last few minutes, I do want to, uh, and I want to make sure we leave lots of time for questions. Um, I do find the one thing with this is the, the more I learn, the more we, I realize I don't know. Developing a study like this has introduced far more questions uh, on, again, why, why girls, uh, why, why some kids, why not. Uh, what are the next treatments? Um, we have a huge, massive data set of now 3,000 children um, with all these outcome results, which is going to generate even more uh, future research, which we're really excited to uh, start studying now in the next uh, few months and, and years coming on. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank all of you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take uh, questions with the time that remains. All right. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, we do have quite a, a few questions listed here, but uh, as I mentioned, please don't hesitate to type yours in. We do have about, about 30 minutes uh, left before of our scheduled time anyway, so uh, so lots of time to take some more questions if you are thinking of some. Uh, the first question that came in uh, was from Catherine, and she's just uh, she's talking about um, the criteria that you mentioned in the scoring about uh, slow to respond to questions, I believe. She's saying, in addition to the SLP processing, she says many of her patients report word finding difficulties, difficulty speaking in full sentences, and difficulty following quick conversations. Did you monitor any of those specifically? So um, we did me we did measure uh, word finding, and we did uh, measure that as part of the SCAT three does have uh, word recall in which children are given five words to repeat immediately, mm -hmm. and then we tech um, a intermediate recall. Um, so that is something we tested. Uh, interestingly enough, kids did not um, have, um, that was not an independent predictor as compared to the question that did make to the list. Um, again, I think the comment though is, is very accurate in the sense that it has something to do with um, more the processing uh, of the information and the speed of the processing um, rather than sometimes the answer itself. But again, we had we did have kids who had errors, but um, uh, on the actual word themselves, where they would repeat the wrong word or could not remember the actual word. But again, um, 
perhaps more importantly than, than that is the speed at which children are processing. A follow-up, she just says it seems uh, for her to be more in spontaneous conversation, uh, but she said that's certainly helpful, your, your response, but it's the spontaneous conversation. Yeah, is, with regards to spontaneous conversation, that's um, more of a, for us, uh, uh, doing evaluating something in the emergency room, it's, it's harder to have a validated scale to do that, so we were restricted more to uh, validated questions and validated uh, tests. Um, for spontaneous uh, conversation, it would be more of a subjective. Are they not quite themselves or... Uh, more of a, is their speech and language not correct? And that's kind of what's captured by the answering questions more slowly, um, subjective assessment. All right. When you were uh, talking about the area under the curve analysis, just sort of identifying the, 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 the better prediction of the, of the tool versus the physicians, did you get any sense or was there any data collected as to when the physicians are making their predictions? Are they gen is there any generalizability around whether they're, are they typically over predicting or under predicting or was that even something that you looked at? They actually um, under predicted, but we even gave them better credit for that. <laughs> I believe we, um, we, um, we had categories, we gave them five categories of timing and almost all under uh, predicted, but we actually gave them um, it was, more how, it was more of a statistical analysis, but if anything, we over, uh, we gave physicians the benefit of the doubt and basically broke it almost down into a low risk and high, but almost all the physicians said that um, the majority of physicians for the majority of patients said that the kids would be better in the, within two weeks. All right, interesting. And that's probably just based on the uh, pre-published um, mantra that 85% of the kids would be better within 7 to 10 days. And that's probably why when physicians were asked to predict the duration, almost all of them thought that um, their kid, we asked them, how long do you think it's going to take for this child to get better? And almost all of them said one week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Uh, Tanya is asking, have you considered integrating any validity measures into your assessment? Um, maybe, um, I'm not sure what the, um, question is inferring to by validity measures. Maybe they could type in and give me an example of what sort of, um, test they were yeah. thinking about. Yeah, no, for sure. If, uh, if, if, if you need any more clarification, we'll certainly, uh, ask the, the asker to uh, type in any, any, yeah. any clarification or for examples and, and we'll come back to that in just yeah, a second. Yeah, for example. Yeah, because I, I mean, the, 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 so validity measures is, again, a, um, something with regards – I'd like a bit more clarification. With regards to the, the, the rule itself, it has been validated, um, but for validity measures, um, a lot of the tools um, that we used have been validated. So that PCSI has been a validated and, and is a reliable scale, and so those questions are that. Um, things like demographics uh, don't really require – uh, validity, um, uh, as per se. Yeah, so she's, she did put, uh, put in a clarification. She's saying measures that enable the clinician to determine symptom or performance validity. She's talking about, you know, to, to identify whether the person is giving a valid account of their symptoms. That's, oh, that's what I mean. Oh, perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Um, we actually did that for the neuropsych testing. Um, that's something that to do validity measures in the uh, emergency room is very challenging. So when we did neuropsych testing, we actually used uh, some, some validity testing to see if um, the patients were actually doing their best effort and or to see if, you know, it's kind of like, are they, are they trying? <laughs> um, uh, and um, we found that... Uh, to do those tests do take some time, and the reality is um, it's a tricky thing to do in the, in the context of an emergency department, and to do those tests take about 10 minutes on their own to do, whereas applying this rule takes about two minutes, and in the emergency department, there's probably only about five minutes to 10 minutes you even have for the entire history, physical exam, and uh, anticipatory guidance that's provided. So um, to do those longer validity testing measures um, uh, were not part of this aspect, but it's something to be, uh, when we analyze our validity testing for the neuropsych testing, uh, uh, we'll uh, hopefully be able to report on that once we have those uh, results analyzed. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Anne is saying there, there, she's with the uh, concussion center at Holland Blurview, and she's saying, uh, knowing these risk factors, what are some suggestions in terms of disclosing this information to youth and families? Is this something that you just keep to yourself and adjust care or, or disclose to prepare the families for what could happen? It's an excellent question. Um, I think what, some of the things we need to do is what's called an implementation study. Um, and that's where the rule is applied in real life and see what are the effects of it. Things that I typically do is the following. First, um, I always uh, encourage power of positive thinking to my patients. So um, I think there's a lot of concussion um, attention in the media and in the news uh, cycles uh, only focus on the tragic um, and um, uh, down negative news of concussion, for, you know, in particularly the, uh, the, the movie that's recently come out. Um, people are very, very worried about the long-term effects. People are worried about the, um, the risks of uh, mental health, uh, suicidality, um, alcohol and substance abuse, and or uh, some of these other long-term uh, very um, challenging sequelae that may, may be a result of uh, multiple concussions. What I focus on in the emergency department is saying, you're going to get better, and, and if the child is at low risk, I treat it as a, um, a way to say, you know what, when I look at all the risk factors for concussion, uh, I, am, I am really optimistic that you're going to be uh, really back on your feet quite soon you know, in just a couple or a few weeks. Um, and I say, but it's still really important that you make sure you don't go back to uh, the sports till you, you're cleared by your doctor uh, because of the fact that we don't want you to get another concussion and uh, risk having the second one be lasting a lot longer or have a more severe injury, um, et cetera. So for the low-risk kids, I, I say, really, I think you're going to get better <clears throat> in, a, in a few weeks. And I'm, I'm very positive about that. Um, and I just say, you know, you'll probably just be able to follow up with your doctor and you might be able to, uh, as soon as you're feeling better, start really um, getting a book, book an appointment in so you can be cleared to the full uh, contact uh, return. Um, for the kids who are high risk, I say, you know, um, I know you had a concussion. Uh, often some of these kids have had prior concussions as well, but even if they haven't, I say, you know, you had a concussion, uh, first of all, it is important to know you are going to get better, but sometimes some kids take a little bit longer than others. And as you can uh, see, you're still having a lot of symptoms right now. And based on all the amount of symptoms you're having right now, I, I feel that using um, uh, this new tool, we're able to uh, help us predict how long you're going to last. Uh, I'm, we're a bit concerned that your symptoms may last a month or more. So what I'm going to do for you is, again, I really want you to follow the, the return to, to learn and the return to play protocols, and I go over that with them at that time. But I say, you know, what I'm also going to do for you is I'm going to send you to the concussion specialist so you can get in sooner so that they can track your care. And if something's uh, not going well in your recovery, they may be able to intervene um, sooner or start some other novel uh, treatments for you. Um, before waiting till you're already a month in. But I do give them a bit of that anticipatory guidance. I don't ever say you are going to last months. Um, I just always use that word risk. Uh, I'm concerned that you, you might have a risk because the way the rule works and the statistics works is it's never perfect for each individual. It's not a 100% specific and 100% sensitive. Um, there are very few tests in, in life that are, but um, that's, uh, that's typically how I uh, manage, it, manage it. So I don't keep it to myself. Uh, I use it in, in the whole constellation of, of everything. This is, again, just one tool on top of my own uh, judgment as, as well. All right. Thanks. So, so do you do you uh, tell them that they are a you know a quote unquote ten on the scale, and that means this, or like do you do you sort of label them with that number, or or, or not? I don't give them a number. No, I typically just I, I break them down into a category. Okay. All right. Typically. So again, and, and it's, I don't even I don't even I just I don't even necessarily say you're low risk. Sometimes I say you're low risk, 
I'm just typically will say it. Uh, I'm really po optimistic that you're going to be uh, recovering very quickly, quicker than most kids with concussion. Mm -hmm. right. And then for the high risk, again, I say I'm worried that you may take longer to recover than other kids with concussion. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we did have a comment coming in that said uh, they are not, they don't seem to be able to access the JAMA article. So if, if you if you can send me a link to that, if you can find the link to the free version. Yeah, I'll uh, put it in the, I'll send it as a, uh, I'll, I'll put it in as a, uh, a link to you. Yes, I'll do that right yeah. now. Yeah, and we can either put that uh, in the question box here and we can put that on the Knowledge Exchange Network where the recording gets posted and we'll, we'll get people access to that okay. information okay. as soon as we can. Um, Pat is saying they work at a clinic uh, called Neuropsychiatry in Calgary and uh, uh, they take post-concussion mental health kits and she says they go back and forth on the time frame to accept patients. Uh, from your presentation, it seems that six months post-concussion might be uh, might make sense to ensure that the symptoms are not likely to be concussion related and are now most likely mental health related? Like is that six months post-concussion seem like a good uh, sort of time frame for someone in that neuropsychiatry setting? So, uh, you know, in gen there's all different um, specialties, specialties and um, what's the ideal time time frame to follow up with that? So, you know, sports medicine um, may follow them up sooner um, especially trying to get them back to their sport. Um, neurology and or neuropsychology may find later. Um, I'm not saying it's only mental health. I'm saying there, it becomes a mixed component once you get to that time frame. Um, to have the initial evaluation or only qualify for uh, things at six months, that may make sense if, again, you need something now to sort out why do you need that? So a question is why, you know, when, when would you need neuropsychological referral? Um, most, we know 30% uh, of kids are still going to have symptom, uh, symptoms at one month. There may not be a lot of neuropsychologists in, in a catchment area, so therefore uh, to have every kid with concussion see a neuropsychologist at one month would probably overburden the healthcare system. So I think a lot of that is what's the ideal timing will depend on the, the resources available to the, each specific uh, uh, healthcare region and or um, the types of uh, services they're able to provide. So it's not saying it's, there's ever a right or wrong time. I think it's always a, a pragmatic balance. Um, but again, the fact that we know that um, once kids do hit six months, I do think it's a good idea to certainly consider sending them to uh, a, nurse, a neuropsychologist if they haven't seen one uh, by that point. Is that, uh, if the person who asked the question has a follow-up, please uh, have them type in if they want uh, to have a follow-up question. All right. All right. We certainly will do that. Uh, and we did find a link. Um, Anne here uh, with me in the office here said that she was able to access it once she created a, an account. It didn't cost anything for an account, but she had to create an account first, and then she was able to access the article. I'm not sure if that's yes. a requirement yes. or not. Right. That, that you, do, you typically do have to uh, just create a free account. Okay. All right. Um, Jeff's asking for the criteria, the slow to answer questions criteria. Is there a quantifiable measure for that, or is that just subjective? It's a subjective yes-no question. It's a question that's not asked to the patient. It's asked to the caregiver. Mm -hmm. All right. Because the patient uh, may not, the patient may not be even aware that they're answering questions slowly. Okay. All right. So that, that's one of the questions that's on the ACE. It's a yes-no question on the ACE. Okay. And so an example is uh, you turn to the parent and you say, um, has has your has your daughter Jane? been answering questions more slowly since the concussion? And they would either say yes or, or no. All right. Um, one of the things I found interesting when you were com uh, looking at the criteria, I mean, just the, by virtue of being a, a teenage girl, you already get four points uh, right on the scale. There. That's really quite uh, significant compared to some of the other criteria. Uh, this, yeah. Uh, yeah this, uh, the question came from Shauna. She's saying, are we potentially at risk of over-pathologizing girls based on a response bias toward symptom endorsement as compared to boys? Girls more likely to say yes, boys more, boys more likely to say no, et cetera, as is symptom report subjective subjectivity is high. Yeah, we don't know if um, it's a theory for why girls are more likely, but that's not proven. We don't, we, we have not proved that girls are more likely to answer yes or no. It's a, that's a theory that might explain why girls appear to be at higher risk. Um, so um, yes, it's recognized that uh, 
there's certainly uh, higher girls and higher for teens. Um, that's just how the numbers worked out. Um, with regards to how do we deal with that going forward, um, I think we need more research. And I think um, there are some studies that are coming up to look to study the um, the functional MRIs in those children. It's possible that the girls are having uh, greater disturbances when we look on their functional MRI scanning. Uh, that's a study that's to be started at five centers across Canada um, in the upcoming month, and it's a couple-year study. So that might be one possibility. Um, as part of that study, we'll be looking at their, um, their stages of puberty, and so there may be effects of that. There are other studies that may be looking at um, uh, other factors to further explore this uh, relationship too, but um, whether or go whether or not it's pure reporting or not, that's only a theory. Um, as a possible explanation, it's not yet proven though. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, Elizabeth is asking: Is this uh, tool being utilized in the emergency departments that participated? You listed quite a number of centers that are partic participated in this study, and you mentioned that you use it personally. Is this used sort of as a standard of practice within CHEO's emergency department? And then, how widely across the country are you aware of this tool being used? Well, the, it only was published um, just, a, just about a month ago, um, so we're in the process of uh, doing the knowledge uh, exchange and knowledge mobilization, and hence uh, part of the reason why I'm on uh, this webinar today is to continue to spread the word. Um, it's something that uh, the, probably the best way to implement something like this is to use electronic health medical records. Um, so I've actually been in contact with the National Institute of Health in the United States, and then um, in the United States, the NIH is, um, in, is already working on creating a plug-in uh, for um, people who use the various types of uh, electronic health records, and they'll be distributing that to create a, a, an active registry of, I think, 40 different hospitals in the U.S., in which all those questions from the 5P will be embedded into this plug-and-play in which then hospitals can then um, fill it out prospectively as just part of the questionnaires of kids who come in with a suspected head injury. Um, I hope to do the same sort of thing in uh, Canada, but that uh, will require a bit of funding, and that's something that we're we're looking into. Yeah, embedding it into the electronic health records process, that's certainly a fantastic way to, to sort of uh, make it more automatic uh, for people as far as an implementation. Yes. And, it, and it takes just a few seconds, and almost all the questions are, are there anyway, so... Their age uh, doesn't even need to be asked, um, and uh, it would, the only thing the physician would really have to do is about five, five questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the Jacqueline is asking, as you, or she's saying, that she was interested to see that younger age was associated with lower risk for persistent symptoms, which is counter to what has been found in the literature for outcomes following moderate to severe uh, traumatic brain injury, where younger isn't necessarily better. Any thoughts on why that might be the case? Um, a couple ideas. First is the amount of energy transferred to the brain. Um, to create a concussion, you need to have... Um, a high, a high enough amount of energy. Once higher amounts of energy occur, that's when you do get the, the bleeding or, or something with regards to that. So the reasons that um, sometimes we see the poor outcomes for the severe uh, TBI uh, with kids is um, they, are, they have fallen from a higher spot and therefore their skulls are thinner and therefore it's, um, uh, more energy can be transferred. However, for the concussion, we know that um, this is not something that's showing up on a picture. And so to have enough energy to cause a concussion but not to cause a severe um, is a very narrow window of that energy. And because of their size and because of their speed, um, they're probably just not generating as much physical uh, strain uh, on the brain. And that's something that we're actually looking at. We collected additional data on the mechanism and, this is, and all these uh, injuries were re constructed in a, in, a, in a laboratory using crash test dummies measuring um, the force, the accelerations, and the rotational energy, um, and a, a factor known as the maximal principal strain to each section of the brain. And what we've been finding is that the, the, the younger kids have just a lot less energy being transferred to the head. So that's probably the, 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 the most straightforward explanation. And or then there's always the potential bias that the, the kids don't um, 
recognize your symptoms as much that there's, they may not therefore may not report it as, as much as well but more likely than not it's the energy factor and hence that slide the more I the more I know the, the more I learn the less I know yeah yeah all right uh, so I think we have uh, exhausted all of the questions uh, just one more comment from uh, from uh, Catherine who said congratulations and, and, and says it's a very important addition to the literature and I couldn't agree more so uh, so with that being said maybe we'll wrap up the questions there uh, and we'll just hand it over to, to you dr. Zemek for just any any final thoughts or closing key messages that you'd like to uh, leave the audience with before we wrap up you know, the, the key messages are, you know, concussion is common. Um, while I did present that a lot of kids do go on to have persisting symptoms, um, it's really important to focus on the positive and focus on the fact that kids can recover. I'm also, uh, as you heard in my talk, I'm not advocating that kids not remain active in sports. I think healthy active living is, is so vital. And so we need to be doing things to address the prevention aspect. Are there are rules, changes that we can do to reduce the number of concussions but still keep kids active? And a perfect example of that is the, the age of checking that's allowed in hockey. Uh, the older they are, the less concussions we see. Uh, the, the higher we increase the, the minimum age for uh, checking. Um, are there things that we can do to start um, addressing the... Um, and to mitigate the, the symptoms, I think, is the next key step. It's our responsibility as clinician scientists and researchers to really start tackling what is the ideal time to return to school, to return to play, um, and uh, in order to mitigate the, the, the risks of having these persisting symptoms because, um, personally, I think these, these numbers are way too high, um, and we need to do something to really... Uh, get these numbers uh, down because it is something that does really impact the way children live their lives, their quality of life, and again, preventing them from doing the things they want, need, and, and love to do. Um, I do hope that all of you will apply the the 5P rule to the patients that you uh, see in your, your cube management. And um, while the actual number is not as important to share as a patient, I think providing accurate anticipatory guidance um, really helps uh, frame what expectations are and if a patient uh, knows that they may be symptomatic for a month and then um, it may at least help reduce some of the anxiety such that if it's now three weeks and they're not getting better they don't get that vicious cycle of why am I not better why am I not better they knew that it was potentially going to last for a month and thus prevent having that vicious cycle of anxiety um, having their symptoms last even beyond um, again, this is still the tip of the iceberg, and uh, we look forward to answering uh, and tackling the questions that have arisen from the study in the subsequent uh, years and, and decades. Thank you very much. And one more thing before you go. You did have that uh, uh, the image from the Will Smith movie, uh, The con Concussion. Uh, have you seen the movie, and did you want to give your 10-second uh, review of the movie if you have seen it? I have seen the movie. Uh, my, my review is Will Smith's an excellent actor. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think it's, a, it's an important topic. Um, I think we're talking still about a different um, process still in the adults, and uh, I think it's, it behooves us, though, to think about um, these choices in kids. And um, a lot of the issues that I think that are uh, arising from that movie is the, the risks of, of dozens or hundreds of concussive or even sub-concussive sub blows and what are the effects of that. Um, there's still minimal to any uh, evidence on what are the effects of, of sub-concussive blows, and that's something that we need to explore uh, going forward. I do think, as I mentioned earlier, talking about those things like rule changes are there things to do to uh, encourage kids to maintain healthy, active living but reduce their risks of head injury? I think are really important. Um, the whole culture of uh, mixed martial arts and uh, um, the, that sort of cage type um, uh, violence um, is something that uh, to me as a pediatrician and a parent is disturbing. And, the purpose of having these things to knock kids out, I think, is uh, an example of something that should be, you know, not allowed in in, in youth at all. Um, but again, with regards to the concussion movie and that, um, 
CTE is a, I do believe it does exist as an entity, but what are the risks for children who suffer one or two or even three concussions? Um, I still think we're, we're still a long way away from being able to provide an answer for that. All right. Well, thank you very much. And with that, I think we'll wrap up. Th thanks again for a great presentation, and thanks to the audience. I mean, Dr. Zemek mentioned uh, the, PD uh, the the concussion guidelines that uh, were supported by the uh, Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, et cetera. We did a presentation on that with Nick Reed and and Nick and Sa uh, Nick Reed and Sarah Reed, two different Reeds, um, uh, who were part of the team that developed that. Uh, we did that uh, about a year ago or, or so. Uh, so that's up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. If you want to see that specific presentation around the concussion guidelines. You can find that on our Knowledge Exchange Network uh, with some other links to the actual resources on the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation's website, etc. So don't uh, make sure you check that out when you are on the Neuro, uh, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, we do our when uh, uh, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it, as you can see, it's always great when you can watch live because we can have these great discussions and we can uh, take your questions and, and and carry on that conversation. But when you can't, of course, as I mentioned, we do record these and make them available after the fact on the can at can.cafc.org. Uh, next week, we'll hear from Dr. Penny Corkum, Dr. Wendy Hall, and Dr. Graham Reed about uh, uh, children's sleep, uh, sleep problems, importance of sleep, and solutions. And we're going to be introduced to the Better Nights, Better Days uh, team. Uh, they're going to present an overview of children's healthy sleep, developmental changes in sleep, types of sleep problems, uh, children experience medical problems affecting sleep, negative impact of poor sleep on children and families' well-being, and typical approaches to helping parents address their children's sleep problems. We'll also uh, describe an innovative online intervention for children aged 1 to 10 with behavioral sleep problems called Better Nights, Better Days, and how that's being evaluated using a, a randomized control trial. And then following that on June 1st, we're going to be hearing from CAFC's community of practice on transitioning of children to adult health services. Uh, and we're going to be hearing from Kush Amaria and some other folks from that community of practice to, to talk about the guidelines and recommendations that they've been working on over the last few years. So some great work that they've done that they're very excited to present to our community. So some great stuff coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks again for joining us today and we hope to see you back here next week. Bye everyone.